here, scurvy dogs, and ahoy you too, scurvy bitches. I'd like to point out that I am a non-biased and open-minded pirate. I might have been educated by brutes, but we knew better than to discriminate between stupid bilge rats and annoying wenches. But enough politeness, it's time to jump again headfirst in the darkest dung abysses that the interconnection network has to offer. I know you like it, you little coquinu, otherwise you wouldn't be watching. I was quietly sailing on a boring flow of insipidity, hunting my next prey, when my eyes caught something I was not expecting. An English anti-evolution video translated in French on a channel called anti literally anti-atheist. The French title means the hidden face of the evolution misleading theory. I will not criticize too much the quality of the translation, which is not always good, because let's face the fact. I speak each one of me three main languages as bad as the others. And admit it, a French land rat speaking English well enough to translate a 10 minutes long video it's something we have to encourage and congratulate. Even if it's a shame it's 10 minutes full of shit. Evolutionists directed all their attention to the claim that man evolved from ape-like creatures. Wow. First sentence and you already lost the battle. Damn, that are going to be 10 long minutes. First word evolutionist. You could replace it throughout the whole video by scientist. But I think that the obvious comment is an intelligent design bullshit and therefore it tries to sell creationism as a serious scientific alternative. Then you say, men evolve from ape-like creatures. Nope. The whole point is that men are apes. Chimpanzees are our nearest cousins. In phylogeny, which is described by Wikipedia as the study of the evolutionary history and the relationships among individuals or groups of organisms, you cannot give a name to a taxon, some sort of animal family here if you want, and exclude a part of it. It would be like disinheriting dumb grandson Kevin. I know he deserves it, but it's still unfair. We did not evolve from ape-like creatures. We are apes, and we have a common ancestor with the chimpanzees, for example. Let's say that men and chimpanzees are cousins. It means that we have the same grandpa. But the tricky thing is that grandpa was neither a chimpanzee nor a human. Grandpa is as different to us as is to the chimpanzees. And look, even if your real life cousin looks more like your real life grandpa than you, well, at least when he was young, it doesn't mean that he's closer to him than you. It's just visual. You are both his beloved, ungrateful scumbag grandsons. <laughs> 6,500 different ape species have lived so far, and the majority of them are extinct. Well, actually that's the case for all species on Earth. 99% of all species known are extinct. And actually, that's one of the arguments for evolution. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> but I know that's not what you were thinking about. For you, it's that somehow there are, has been up to 6,500 unrelated species that somehow look similar to each other and they mostly did not live at the same time. Funny, eh? Must be completely unrelated. The skulls of these extinct apes, both big and small, constituted a great resource for evolutionists on which to exercise their imaginations freely. Arranging the skulls of these extinct ape species from the smallest to the biggest and adding some skulls of vanished human races to the series, evolutionists concocted the scenario of human evolution. Yep, just like that. One there, one here, a bit of this, a bit of that, and a long rail of cocaine while writing the article and hop, you got it buddy, please welcome the evolution! Woohoo! Okay, let's try. It's not from the smallest to the biggest. First, one tries to know when the individual died thanks to 
the carbon 14 technique for example or using elements surrounding the bodies like constructions uh, remaining signs of particular environmental features then the structure of the whole available parts of the skeleton is examined basically you take as landmark features the ones that are commonly shared between various species of apes some that you will find also in humans and some others that you will not find in humans then you look if these structures are present, different or absent. From all these pieces of information, you may try to place the individual in the family tree. If the features get always closer to the human's ones with the time, then you may assume that the individuals used to be some of our family members, at least some great-great-uncles or and aunties. However, you'd better watch out. You have to take in account the principle of parsimony and pay attention to the changes. It might happen that a species presents features that are similar to humans and others that do not match what they should be if it was fitting in the model. You might be looking at a great cousin. Please take care to give him his rightful place on the family tree and not to call him grandpa. But unlike what you try to present, that's how scientists always work and sometimes they correct their first statements accordingly. We'll speak about that later. The most important role of this scenario is given to the extinct ape species called Australopithecus. The first Australopithecus fossil was found in 1924 by a paleontologist named Raymond Dart. Since then, evolutionists argue that this ape species, the name of which means southern ape, is a man-like creature. Okay, I see that you are having issues dissociating the popularization from the research. So let's put the popularization aside. When I say grandpa, it is indeed incorrect. Of course, nobody can say if the Homo sapiens directly descends from individuals like Lucy. What we say instead is that Homo sapiens shares a last common ancestor with the Australopithecus, who is more recent than our last common ancestor with the chimpanzee. So when I say grandpa, I mean maybe grandpa, maybe one of his brothers. As an umbrella term, if you want to simplify a concept that is otherwise well explained in the specialist literature. But if you criticize the scientific background of the concept, don't buy a cheap popularization book. And don't listen to a junk YouTube wannabe pirate. Go get real scientific articles and learn to understand them. However, when Australopithecus and chimpanzee skeletons are compared, it is seen that there is no important difference between the two. Could you try to lie better? Because... You know, with the internet, it's easy to find pictures and see that the differences between both skeletons are clearly visible. Maybe you don't think that the differences are relevant, but once more, we don't care about opinions in a scientific debate. At the very least, we care about evidence-based conjectures from persons who are at least trying to add something constructive to the discussion. Also, for example, human and chimpanzee DNA only differ by about 2%. It's indeed very few, but enough to make a huge difference in the end, doesn't it? In the face of this fact, evolutionists hypothesized that Australopithecus walked upright on its two feet differently from other apes. However, two world-renowned anatomists, Lord Sally Zuckerman and Professor Charles Oxnard, refuted this allegation. Simply put, Australopithecus, advanced as the ancestor of man by evolutionists, is merely an extinct ape species. Okay, Sully Suckerman was an important scientist who also worked for the British government, but his opposition on the bipedality of Australopithecus dates back to the 50s, and his arguments had apparently already been answered during the 50s. Concerning Professor Oxnard, he later corrected his statement by saying Australopithecus did not work upright in human manner. Well, since we did not expect Lucy to have walked upright and holding a cup of tea with the pinky finger up, 
it's not the point. Interesting fact, in Thorpe and Colleagues 2007, it was described that bipedality was actually a common feature in some situations for old world apes. So the argument of no bipedality at all for Australopithecus is already out. There comes therefore a question much more interesting. What features have changed in Australopithecus that indicate a change from occasional bipedality to a mostly bipedal way of moving? Well, the pelvis, the knee, the femur, and some back characteristic that have been implemented from the fragments found. Of course, the skeleton is not complete, but it's the same principle as a partial puzzle. Even with missing pieces, you are still able to include or exclude possibilities for the assembly and how it should look like. Of course, you can never have the exact picture, but that's not a reason for not assembling together what you can. If you want some reading on the topic, Humankind Emerging of Bernard Campbell and Lovejoy and Orwell 2010. And actually this book and this article might differ on certain points, and that's the whole science thingy. It's a debate until some hypotheses are left aside and other emerge or are being kept. Funnily, many things have been excluded since Lucy's discovery, but not the very principle of evolution. More to that later, don't worry. On the other hand, fossils that are included by evolutionists under imaginary classifications, such as Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, or Homo sapien archaic, in fact belong to different human races. Just because you do not understand why they are classified this way does not imply that it's imaginary. And I prefer the term ethnics to races. I know that Anglo-Saxons don't mind using the term race, but it's still an inaccuracy. When these fossils are inspected, it is seen that their skeletons are essentially the same as those of people living today. Funny that you say essentially, because that's exactly the point. We do not focus on the similarities, but on the differences. That you don't think that they are important, it's your own opinion. But since you don't seem to know much about it, I will not be forced to give it work. Yeah, don't force me to give one. You don't want to see me shaking that booty. Or do you? The only dissimilarities are a few structural differences in their skulls. But differences like these are to be found in different human races alive on Earth today. The famous evolutionist paleontologist Richard Leakey admits that the difference between the skulls classified as Homo erectus and those of modern men is only racial. These differences are probably no more pronounced than we see today between the separate geographical races of modern humans. Richard Leakey is a Kenyan paleoanthropologist, conservationist and politician. What he meant with this sentence is that the appearance of this species is close to ours. But does appearances always mean so much in life? Well, a good counterexample is FLYING FRAUDS! A FASCINATING TOPIC! AWESOME! Did you know that many different frog species develop the ability to achieve gliding flight? Although they develop INDEPENDENTLY! CRAZY! Like somewhere not even on the same continent! INCREDIBLE! And here, an explosion! <laughs> so what you gonna learn, kids? Don't trust appearances! And also, once more, you're a bit quick on judging the similarities. I can only recommend you to check the French Wikipedia page about Neanderthals. You can see that the overall shape might be mistaken for a Homo sapiens, but the details definitely don't match. Furthermore, DNA analysis provided once more the solid evidence needed to prove that you're being a dick. <laughs> The only defense left to evolutionists against all these scientific facts is just one thing, propaganda. And there you just said the dirty word. So what's the definition of propaganda? 
Propaganda is information, especially of a bias or misleading nature, used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. Propaganda is often associated with the psychological mechanisms of influencing and altering the attitude of a population toward a specific cause, position, or political agenda in an effort to form a consensus to a standard set of belief patterns. Okay, and what is science? Science is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. You haven't brought anything to the debate except for half-understood out-of-context sentences pronounced more than a century ago and you haven't analyzed shit. So you are the one doing propaganda. You don't bring knowledge, you bring an opinion and sell it as if it was equally relevant as years of research. But I'll let you go further in your reasoning, because you will later bring by yourself the evidence that science is not propaganda. Scientists do mistakes, but due to the way of working of science, these mistakes shed more light on what went wrong and allow an improvement of the method together with the improvement of the knowledge. Religion has a set of idea and forbids any change. More to that from your own mouth after a speed up of your bullshit. The baseless scenario of the human evolution is imposed on the public by means of imaginary drawings that appear in evolutionist publications. In these drawings, creatures with hairy bodies and simian features are decked out with overtones of human-like motifs. The given impression is that these half-man, half-ape transitional forms did live once. From time to time, drawings that present snapshots from the social life of these creatures are made. These misleading drawings are introduced in a particular sequence to engrave the scenario of the human evolution on the subconscious of society. Even in the most famous scientific publications, there frequently appear such window dressings called reconstructions and imaginary family tree drawings made by their inspiration. The imaginative power of evolutionists is not limited to fictional drawings and models. They go even further and shoot movies in which imaginary half-man, half-ape half creatures act. Horrible lies and conspiracy. I understand. But where did you get these pictures? Are they truly the work of scientists? Or are they illustrations from books or magazines for science popularization purposes? Because in this case, these are indeed imaginary representations that have nothing to do with the research in this field. And therefore, we do not give a twerk about their accuracy. They are used to illustrate, not to prove. The accuracy of the depiction has to be criticized and improved, but it does not imply that the scientific work on which it is based is as inaccurate as the drawing. However, all of these are pure deception. The only evidence at hand is generally nothing more than a few skull fragments or a tibia. The hair, skin, nose, ears, lips, or other facial features of a living being cannot be determined from its bone remains. Evolutionists shape these soft tissues, which leave no trace in the fossil, to suit the purposes of their theory and produce imaginary reconstructions in their workshops. Yeah. The only problem here is that these techniques are also the one used in forensic reconstruction, which allow to recreate the faces on skulls fawn, for example. The recreation of the soft tissues, such as the muscles, is also what has been used since centuries in taxidermy. And yes, darling, you're going to tell me, well, the muscle models for human skulls and taxidermy are well known, and we do have living examples running around. And I'll say to that, you're damn right for once, sweet typhus ladybug. But I'll first have a shot of absinthe while you misquote a book from 1931. Ernest Houghton from Harvard University states that these drawings have no scientific value. You can, with equal facility, model on a Neanderthaloid skull the features of a chimpanzee or the lineaments of a philosopher. These alleged restorations of ancient types of man have very little, if any, scientific value and are likely only to mislead the public.
evolutionists go so far in this subject that they can even invent very different faces for the same skull. The three entirely different reconstructions made for the fossil calls in Santropus is a famous example showing how persistent evolutionists are in producing these false masks. Basically, in forensic reconstruction, you know where the muscles have to be and you look for marks on the bones where they used to be attached. You recreate these muscles using clay, for example, and then you just have to cover the model with the skin. And there you go, you have a face. And yes, maybe the dude was fat, maybe he was extremely skinny, maybe he had Cory Taylor's neck and jaw muscles, Michael Jackson or Cyrano de Bergerac's nose. Maybe he was blonde, maybe he was red-haired, maybe he had blue eyes, or maybe were they brown. There are still a lot of parameters that may change quite a lot, but there you go. It's still a tool that is extremely useful and that has proven its utility more often than you will ever prove yours. Yes, Skin color, hair color, hairiness, and the precise position and form of the muscles might be missing. But why shouldn't we try all the possibilities? And that's the sense of the three reconstruction. It's not so much that some people independently lied about how one could best fake a face. It was most probably successive different interpretation in order to find out all possibilities. But yes, you are right, darling dear. Anthropomorphism is a plague in science. As human beings, we all tend to see similarities to ourselves everywhere. But that's also why the latest representation of the Zingentropus tend to take a bit of distance and represent the Paranthropus boise closer to a chimpanzee than to a human. Evolutionists engage not only in drawing and modeling tricks, sometimes they commit deliberate forgeries. The most famous of these frauds is the Piltdown Fossil, introduced in England in 1912 by an evolutionist named Charles Dawson. This fossil was presented as the most important transitional form between ape and man and was displayed in museums for more than 30 years. Experts who re-examined the fossil in 1949 discovered that it was a forgery that had been produced by attaching an orangutan's jaw to a human skull. Yes. This is a true and sad story. Charles Dawson built his entire career on lies, forgeries and frauds, and led many scientists on false path. But was Charlie an evolutionist? Well, he was an amateur archaeologist who surely thought the evolution theory to be true, but let's face it, he was a mythomaniac. Douche. And this has nothing to do with science. But tell me, who were the people who researched and debunked it? Courageous creationists? Selfless saltationists? Altruistic theologians? Nope. Arthur Keith and various anatomists from the Smithsonian Institution were certainly not to be put in these categories. What you just friendly showed is that the scientific community makes sure to correct itself. Thanks, buddy. Another intermediate transitional form fabricated by evolutionists was the Nebraska man. This was cooked up in 1922 on the basis of a single fossil tooth. The evolutionists did not neglect to give it an ostentatious Latin name, Asparapithecus Harold Cookai, or to make imaginary drawings related to it. It was soon revealed that the tooth that had been the source of inspiration for Nebraska Man in fact belonged to a wild pig. This picture of teeth is unrelated and irrelevant. I have no idea why you are using it. And yes, once more a mistake that has been corrected by scientists later. It's now almost one century ago. For comparison, the lies of George W. Bush Jr. in order to invade Iraq are only from 2003 and most American people have already forgotten them, although we still live with their worldwide devastating consequences. Many other fossil skulls have been presented as great evidence for evolution failed one by one. Yeah? Show me!
Neanderthal man was advanced as evidence in 1856, dismissed in 1960. Well, it was just proven that Neanderthal was a cousin and not an ancestor. That does not disprove the theory. If anything, it confirms it, because a cousin has the same grandparents. Got it, buddy? Piltdown man was advanced as evidence in 1912, dismissed in 1953. You are repeating yourself. You are boring. Person. Zenzanthropus was advanced as evidence in 1959, dismissed in 1960. A great grand uncle. Again, it doesn't disprove anything, and as you say yourself, within one year, the scientists already corrected their first statement and put it in its rightful place on the family tree. Ramapithecus was advanced as evidence in 1964, dismissed in 1979. Again, this is an ape that was misplaced as grandpa for the humans, but he was then placed as grandpa for the orangutan in the family tree. I don't think this is what one could consider a failure of the theory. It shows that evolution also occurs for other species. Despite all these facts, these skulls are still presented to the public through the media and in some evolutionist textbooks as if they were scientific facts. What? What facts? You did not present anything. And yes, books from 1920 will still have these pieces of information, but the ones published by scientific accurate authors and editors will not contain it anymore. It's a bit like contemporary history books. Yes, in old and bad contemporary history books, you hear about Czechoslovakia. But fact is that this country does not exist anymore and has been split between the Czech Republic and Slovakia. In many countries, an important part of the society supposes that evolution is a proven fact. Because we do have evidences that no other theory is sufficiently backed up by facts and serious research. A great deal of this so-called evidence of evolution, much of which has been dismissed by evolutionists themselves, is still presented to school children in their textbooks, where they are depicted as the ancestors of man. Yes, indeed, the teaching of evolution sucks badly. I remember as a pupil in a French-speaking country that I was told something that was much closer to Lamarckism than to Darwinism, although Lamarckism had been dismissed already a long time ago. I don't know if this was a pan-French chauvinistic reflex, because teaching something from a Brit might be seen as a treason, or just a misunderstanding of the teaching by the teachers. But in the end, it does not matter much, yes. The teaching sucks, but it doesn't imply anything about the scientific findings themselves. I'll be pleased to speak with you about possible improvements in our school systems, but I guess we might want to throw us each other overboard after a few arguments, so let's forget that you are an empty shell without argument and with delusional preconceived conclusions. So, what's the takeaway message from this video? Use scientific literature rather than popularization summaries. Use up to date documents and articles. Always criticize constructively each new knowledge, even or rather particularly if they show something you want to see. I said constructively, which means that you have to bring something to the debate in the form of fact-supported, non-biased and testable evidences. Questioning your own opinion allows to reconsider all evidences and reinforce them ultimately with other elements that were not present at the beginning of the debate. But it does not mean changing your mind each time a backward redneck quotes books from the last century or from two millennia ago. Well, I guess we'll see us at the next plundering deckhands. Sell safe and keep on using your brains. sun refuse to shine then may the shackles be undone may all the old words cease to rhyme if the sky turn into stone 
It wouldn't matter, not at all For there is no heaven in the sky Hell does not wait for all downfall Let the voice of reason shine Let the peers vanish for all time God's face is hidden, all unseen You can't ask him what it all means He was never on your side God was never on your side Let right or wrong alone decide God was never on your side, never on your side See ten thousand ministries See the holy righteous dogs They claim to heal but all they do is steal Abuse your faith, cheat and rob If God is wise why is he still, when these false prophets call him friend? Why is he silent, is he blind? Are we abandoned in the end? Let the sword of reason shine Let us be free of prayers and shrine God's face is hidden, turn away He never has a word to say He was never on your side God was never on your side Let right or wrong alone decide God was never on your side, never on your side.